Hey guys, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us. Uh, we've got a great guest today. We've got Jonathan Velasquez, who I'm so excited to talk to. If you haven't yet, go ahead and like, give the stream a like, say hi down in the chat, be sure to talk amongst yourself, have fun. Um, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, we're going to have a great chat today. So Jonathan is the um, creative director for Hello Good Media, his own media company. And he's also the host of the uh, Crack of Smiles podcast, which just started. And the, there's a link in the description to go subscribe to that if you want to listen to that. He's just started putting out episodes and he's got a great lineup of guests. So I'm really excited to talk to him. Guys, why don't we go ahead and welcome him? Uh, let me turn off the camera. There it is. <laughs> There it is. How you doing, Jonathan? <laughs> hey, Ian. How's it going? Hello, everyone out there. How y'all doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here, man. Yeah, so full disclosure, first of all, everyone. Uh, Jonathan's actually, uh, we were friends before I started doing all these live streams. Um, and yeah, I used to work with his partner. And so we've known each other for a little while before he started doing Hella Good Media back when I was working in the nonprofit sphere, too. So uh, it's good to see you again. I haven't seen you since I moved from California. So that's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's the, the whole, you know, uh, shelter in place and all that. I think we maybe before the, the holidays is probably the, the last time, you know, we, we got to see each other. Yeah, I want to say like it was sometime right before we went into lockdown. I want to say like February or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Tell them a little bit about who you are, what your company is, what you do, all the, whatever you think is relevant there. Yeah. So uh, hello, y'all. My name is Jonathan. I am a creative director at Hella Good Media and also uh, owner of uh, the Smize Eyewear. So uh, two separate business ventures, but really how they started uh, is a little bit more of my work in uh, the nonprofit space community organizing. So uh, one thing that we did was, you know, saw a big gap in the amount of like video marketing material and storytelling, visual storytelling um, in the nonprofit community organizing space. So uh, we launched this uh, media company back in June 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic, realizing that all our communities are online now. Uh, part of the reason we're doing this podcast uh, Ian, I'm sure part of the reason you, you jumped into this, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to connect with our online audiences uh, in all these respective like community spaces is very important to us. So we just want to help uh, nonprofits and small businesses really tr make that transition um, effectively uh, where they're able to engage with folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you're talking about working with nonprofits. And I'd love it if you could explain like what the mission of the company is, what you're trying to uh, when you work with a nonprofit, what are you trying to achieve with that? Yeah, so uh, when we work with nonprofits, and, and really it's, I, I try to boil it down to the simple, like helping nonprofits tell better stories. Mm -hmm. And that, in essence, is, is our mission, right? Uh, nonprofits do a lot of great work in our community. Mm -hmm. And you, having worked for nonprofits, uh, me, my uh, 10 plus years being in the nonprofit world, uh, one of the things that is true is that nonprofits do great work. They don't always do such a great job of telling these stories. Um, the countless people that they serve, uh, the countless different drives, um, community work that they do uh, isn't really told. And part of the reason is, is because uh, they aren't as up to date with the full capacity of uh, social media. Uh, and the different possibilities. So um, oftentimes they are really trying to target their their key like client demographics that they follow that population, not realizing that there's this opportunity to speak with the larger community out there. So that's really what we're trying to do is, is help bridge that uh, divide between uh, not just the people that they serve, but the entire community that benefits from their services. Mm -hmm. Something that makes me think of is I heard recently about I was hearing somebody talk about the structure of NASA and they were talking about how a lot of the administrators of NASA, especially in the time period they were talking about, were scientists who had like kind of worked their way up through the ranks. But the skills of a scientist and the skills of an administrator of a massive organization are not necessarily the same skills. And so um, there were some issues that they ran into there and eventually NASA started hiring like MBAs and stuff to do the um, kind of management leadership. 
Is that the same kind of um, thing that you're getting at where somebody who's good at running a nonprofit might not also necessarily be great at media outreach and communications and all that, that those might be two separate skill sets and you're trying to fill in the gaps there? Yeah, essentially. Uh, one of the things that, that we're still seeing, uh, and I, I think this is pretty true across most nonprofits, is uh, like capacity is almost non-existent for any type of marketing issues or um, that that they sort of have. They they probably have like a team of one to like three people, uh, and it's generally like an overall like communications that's also tied into like. Uh, fundraising and uh, fund development and they wear all these hats so uh, you yourself being a content creator me myself being a content creator right we, we realize that it's a full-time job for like mm -hmm. a one to two people to really manage all these different social media platforms uh, and that's where we're essentially trying to support these nonprofits with is being able to one either consult them on effective social media strategy um, and sort of the visual storytelling pieces that they're able to produce in-house, or we can take that work and do it for them um, and able to, to help and support them. So um, there's just a, 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 I would say, a lot of opportunity for, for them to, to really um, test the waters with this. And that's something that, you know, I'm, I'm working with a few agencies right now, and we're trying to get them to the point. But the other thing that, that we often see is that uh, there's a lot of, like, mysticism. Uh, you know, no, that's probably not the best word for it, but, uh, like, myths surrounding, like, what, what they're supposed to post, what not to post, you know, how to engage with people. Uh, and we're just trying to make that as simple as possible for them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like... Um... And now that I'm in the business, I have a better sense of this, but I feel like people underestimate how much work goes into content creation. For my main videos that we put out on Saturdays, for each minute of the video, it's probably between one to two hours of work between um, the writing, filming, and editing. And then maybe even more than that if, you inc if you're including the writing, actually. Maybe that's just the filming and the editing. But so if I'm putting out a... 15 minute video then that's going to be 20 to 30 hours of work for that video probably uh, which is almost a, like a full work week which explains why I work much more than full time right now um, but I, I feel like a lot of people don't understand how much work goes into that as someone recommended to me once they're like oh what you should do like a f every morning you put out like a five minute thing just running through the news of the day and I'm like all right so you're asking for like six hours a day of more work from me <laughs> I don't really have that time to commit um, and then when you add on top of that all of the other stuff that has to be done and as far as like managing social medias and whatever other content you're putting out um, it really is a ton of work and um, even for me doing like a one person uh, as a one man show, it's filling up, you know, more than a full work week. And if you're a big nonprofit that's trying to do a lot more than I am potentially, um, you're going to need like this whole production team. Yeah. And, and uh, you, you hit it right on the head. Uh, this, this is a lot of work. And, and we also have to be mindful that, you know, uh, burnout in the nonprofit world is, is already really high and these people juggle multiple roles uh, and on top of that most of these folks are, are working from home now and are actually working more than they normally would used to because it, it's so hard to like check out i still receive folks uh either from like clients or, or like co-workers right like emails past like 8 p.m which isn't uncommon to begin with but uh th there has to be some mm -hmm. level of uh separation and uh, really making it easier for, for folks to be able to produce uh, some sort of content that people are going to find uh, either engaging, entertaining, or informing um, that they want to sort of uh, uh, be connected with, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what we're, we're trying to do is be able to help these nonprofits uh, find their own like little voice online, uh, which is, is harder said than done, but once we get to that point, that that's when we really start leveraging the different tools available to them um, to be able to get to those 
specific storytelling pieces. And that's mm-hmm. really what we want to do is, is really humanize um, even more so the work that these nonprofits do. Mm-hmm. So do you think that um, time is the only barrier or do you think that there, what are some other obstacles that nonprofits face that make what you do necessary? Uh, well, for one, I mean, funding is, is usually uh, always up there. If it's not an issue of uh, like organizational capacity, it's an issue of uh, like specific resources of whether or not they, you know, they can dedicate to this. Uh, but aside from that, you know, I, I really think uh, a, a lot of the, the challenges with this uh, are figuring out what to share. And, and that's uh, among everything, like where, where we try to start everyone out with, like some sort of game plan of what to share online. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that sometimes, depending on the organization, they, they find either they might work with like children or uh, some of their clients are like health related clients. So there's uh, not too much you can specifically share uh, with that, right? Be- because there are sort of like HIPAA laws. Mm-hmm. Um, but we can always share like success stories of clients. And I think that's important. And so as long as we have, you know, um, the proper, uh, you know, acknowledgement and release forms, we should be sharing those all the time. We, we should be letting people know, hey, you know, uh, Ian was uh, in this place in his life and we were able to support him and get him through here. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's the... The, the harder part that nonprofits have a, a trouble doing is really selling their programs. Uh, and that's essentially what we're trying to help them do is, is that um, oftentimes we, we have the, the whole field of dreams thing, right? If, if you build it, they will come. But the reality, the reality is a, a lot of people uh, associate free programs or community resources with uh, sort of our most impoverished people. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of these resources are designed for the general community. And, you know, not, not as many people sh- are, like, uh, connected to these resources as uh, they should be, right? And we, we know, especially from, like, uh, the various statistics, is that a lot of people qualify for this. And they just think, uh, for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's not for me. Someone else is doing worse than me. Um, so we really want to, one, be able to, to bridge that sort of... Uh, gap between that uh, and make uh, these various access points to uh, a lot of the nonprofit work and resources that are available. Mm-hmm. So this sounds kind of like um, experience and expertise and like what w- the knowledge of what's a good way to run a uh, social media account or a media um, content is uh, kind of what you offer, right? Yeah, and uh, it's it's really uh, adding this to whatever their their existing marketing efforts are. Mm-hmm. Um, so what oftentimes the the one that nonprofits do specifically is just email marketing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and what we're here to do is, is sort of expand that, um, but also offer our because we are a media company, we our video production, our photography services to help um, craft those specific uh, pieces of content that they would like to share as well. So whether it is capturing those unique uh, customer like testimonials, uh, creating videos about what your organization is doing right now during COVID, um, some of the specific resources, creating uh, promotional videos for those programs, we're here to help uh, tell that story and and, uh, really educate, you know, their, their overall like client base. Awesome. So something that you have talked, mentioned a bunch when you've talked to me about your company is the importance of community and community building um, by nonprofits. And nonprofits have a mission. They have a thing to get done. Like if they're Greenpeace, they're trying to get done uh, environmental activism. Or we talked to uh, someone from the San Francisco Baykeepers a few weeks ago in this podcast who they're trying to get done litigation and protection of the waters in uh, San Fr- the San Francisco Bay Area. But at the same time, it's important to be a part of the community more broadly, both uh, just for the ability to support the community and this community to support you, but also because being a part of the community makes them more likely to 
engage with you to support your work financially, do things like that. And so what are the ways that nonprofits can engage with this community and like not even as much engage, but like be a part of the community, be a good community member in other ways that aren't necessarily directly their goal without detracting from their main ob objective. Yeah, so uh, one of the ways uh, that sort of these nonprofits can, can really achieve that whole, let me put my phone on silent here. Uh, That's all right. Is, is that... Uh, that they really should be utilizing this uh, this platform of social media for that. That that's essentially the the way that they're uh, being able to build and form these different coalitions, not just with other uh, community stakeholders, other nonprofits, right? But um, to really have some sort of relationship with everyone out there in the community. One of the the things when we uh, talk to nonprofits about how like their clients. Uh, hear about their programs and services, it's usually word of mouth. So that, that was for us the biggest indicator that, okay, we, we need to focus some of our efforts, uh, not just on, on the, the word of mouth, right? Because we definitely need those, those sort of uh, like community ambassadors, what we like to call them. But we also need to go back and see what we're doing to engage people on this broader scale. Uh, in, in, the, in terms of like our sales, Right, we we call it our, our top of the funnel folks, uh, and we're really trying to to reach this broad audience. So, without uh, taking away from your core mission, like uh, you know, what, whether if you help like families and children, you know, um, there's a lot that fits under that umbrella. Uh, education falls within that. Uh, social justice. Uh, um, what is it, uh, criminal justice reform, right? All, all these different things uh, impact uh, your, your clients and your client base. So for you to, uh, and as an organization, you really need to look at, at the ecosystem in which people uh, sort of live and, and uh, coexist in our community. So um, all these different uh, factors are really impacting them. So for our nonprofit organizations, having this platform where you're able to advocate, um, inform, right, and, and sort of uh, mobilize a little bit more around these larger causes uh, is always beneficial because it, it sort of puts you in uh, the right position uh, as an organization, uh, whether it's, you know, taking a stance on, on uh, one of the things that, that we uh, saw th this past summer, everyone took a stand on uh, anti-racism and, and police brutality, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you just utilizing social media, a simple message from the CEO, from your staff, right, to be able to communicate that, to share those experiences. Um, while it might not directly be a, a part of your mission, it's something that you can always kind of stand, right? And you can use social media to take these, like, line of the stand, uh, stand on different uh, social issues. And, and that's where I really see, um, you know, where, where these nonprofits um, can really... Uh, build these broader coalitions. Do you think that they ever get overextended trying, if you're talking about like a whole umbrella of, use the example of helping children and families, that there's all kinds mm -hmm. of things that can fit under that umbrella. Um, do you think that by trying to do all of these different things that nonprofits ever get overextended by that? I, I think there's a, a difference between um, taking stand on, on different like uh, issues, um, mm -hmm. Uh, and also like voicing their their kind of like opinions on, on different things going on versus committing like hard resources to that and um, this is this is where I kind of see it it's a little bit more of a symbolic gesture that we're really trying to make sure that you know um, these various nonprofits are are kind of doing if from there they, they choose to sort of embed that in their work that's a much longer process um, one of the things that we're, we're seeing in the nonprofit right now is this, this discussion around equity, uh, which is a huge undertaking for, for any organization. Um, but then with that, you know, you, you can say, you know, we, we are in support of educational equity, racial equity, uh, but we're making that work internally first before we're able to move to like the community. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily take away from from your core mission um but in fact it, it better informs your ability to actually like complete it and and achieve that goal so um th there is a uh, to your point you know there, there is a point where you are overextended and i will say for the most part a lot of nonprofits are are kind of overextended to begin with um uh, but it it's this sort of uh ability to to know like where those clear limits are you know for your own individual organization mm -hmm. um so that brings me to something i wanted to ask about um does your company hello good media and Smyas, do you try explicitly to be a social justice centered company is it just kind of something that comes with the territory and if you do try to do that um what how can companies um that are still trying to do this? How can companies make themselves uh, kind of live by those values? Yeah, you know, I I sort of explicitly said about uh, becoming like, uh, you know, and there's there's various like a social justice company, a social responsible company, and there's there's uh, various sort of like different categories, umbrellas that that you kind of fall into. But um, that that was a little bit more explicit only because it's uh, it's a part of who I am mm -hmm. um, coming from the nonprofit world uh, and a lot of my upbringing um, like I, I didn't know how to start a business um, and go full on uh, to what I felt almost like exploitive of, of nonprofits uh, and and that's what what kind of led to, to sort of taking that position um, that and we were seen, you know, just with larger corporations, you know, we, we are very much still a small business, but uh, we we found it easier from the beginning, like, hey, let, let's set our, our values very clear uh, within our mission and vision and how we want to approach the work. Uh, because we know if, if we have that sort of foundation at the beginning, um, we're able to, to kind of progress in a way that we feel is ethical. Uh, versus, you know, trying to go, I, I would say, maybe like full capitalist and maximize profits uh, and then try and, you know, skirt back uh, and, you know, do some other way of, of trying to maybe fiddle the money or uh, donate, right, as a way to to benefit people. But, uh, yeah, it was it was that whole process of, of how do we build a, a company that's responsible, not just to, uh, you know, the people we serve, but the entire community. Mm -hmm. How do you think that you can, without like making it um, even a conscious thing, really, that you're uh, saying to yourself every day, "Oh, how I'm let's I'm doing this to be socially conscious." How can you create a culture where that just kind of comes about within I, a company? I, I think, yeah, I, I think um, at the top level, leadership. Um, has to one uh, be having these conversations um, very regularly not and with that you know I I, I always suggest um, from from various groups that I've, I've kind of worked with around is just at the end of uh, you know meetings or or like check-ins weekly like th those sort of things is, is asking yourself that question is the work we're doing benefiting folks um, benefiting people in the community or how can we also make sure our work is beneficial to others and I, I think that's that's one very uh, conscious question you can always ask yourself uh, aside from that is, is really uh, building a team that is uh, able to sort of think um, through this sort of work is is also key uh, if you have people who are sort of um, a little bit more just inclined to you know just like drive sales right um, maximize profit th those types of things which is good and it, it gets even that way with with the nonprofit world with like uh, finding donors and funding um, that a lot of times uh, we we take this funding from uh, like big banks right that, that maybe uh, don't have your your values in there but you know a, a large contribution um, is necessary sometimes for for these nonprofits. So you know they they take the money, um, and then they're they're sort of and it feels kind of like dirty, right? Mm. Like if if 
So that, that's sort of the, the, the hard part of this is uh, in any sort of business, right? Being able to balance, you know, the need for uh, to be a sustainable company and um, your, your overall values. Mm -hmm. uh, along those same lines, how do you think that individ what, individually, what would be your definition of a good citizen? Because that can vary. But uh, in, in the past, it's often been like someone who, someone who abides by the status quo and doesn't challenge authority. That's what a good uh -huh. citizen is. And to me, I don't know that that necessarily would be the case because that would be, in a lot of cases, also someone who is, if not perpetuating, then at least tolerating uh, oppressive systems. So what to you makes someone a good citizen in the modern day? Mm. I, I would say sort of uh, one uh, still to this day, and this is this is a little bit more of a my, my sort of like Catholic upbringing and, and because I have that that Catholic guilt that I carry with me all the time uh, is it, just that that sort of golden rule, you know, treat others how you want to be treated uh, is, is probably the, the first way to really think about that, you know, is is what I'm doing um, in my work and in, in my life's mission. Um, is it helping or is it hurting others? You know, and, and that's that's always a, a very simple, like, judge if, of where you're at. Uh, is me benefiting, right, also, like, putting someone down? So um, that's probably the first one. Uh, now in, in 2020, uh, in terms of what is a good citizen, I would say a, a big thing is, is being able to look at things critically. Um, I think uh, with, with so much, we, we've kind of gotten polarized where uh, it's the whole like uh, kind of Star Wars, you know, it's it's uh, good versus evil, and it's it's kind of ridiculous, you know, and it's it's so easy to fall into that uh, without looking at things sort of objectively. So I, I think that's another thing that that probably makes a, a very good citizen is is being able to look at things critically and objectively, um, take out some of your your own implicit bias. Um, and then the last thing is, is being able to have these sort of critical conversations with folks uh, in a way, you know, that that's not demeaning, that's not uh, vilifying people, mm -hmm. uh, that's seeking to understand and actually listen. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the more we can do to to actually engage in, in healthy dialogues with, with each other is, is the best thing we can do right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you're saying about being critical about it, it makes me think very much of the... Um the debate about what patriotism is because there are some people that will act as if at least if not argue that patriotism is basically don't question the country don't everything that we ever do is good no matter what and then there's a whole nother group of people that i think i would put myself into where a better form we think that a better form of patriotism is to recognize problems and try to make them better because if you're not going to recognize that something is a problem then it's just going to keep being a problem and now well i mean if you're just is it really so patriotic to let these problems fester um and i i think people don't even re like they probably don't even consciously realize that they're saying to themselves that their patriotism is just don't question whatever the country is they probably don't they're not saying, they, in their heads, that's not how it works. Um, but it's just kind of a, a thing that's built, that's drilled into us, is the idea of not questioning the status quo. Because the, status, the establishment doesn't want to be questioned. <laughs> the established quote, uh, status quo doesn't want to be questioned. So they're perfectly fine if you think patriotism is not questioning them. But I think that we have to, like you said, look critically at problems because problems never get solved if we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would say, like, uh, you know, I consider myself a, a progressive, uh, but but even within that definition, there, there's so many, like, uh, variants of that, you know, and, and for me, the, the simplest thing is that uh, when I say that is that not everything is working right now, to, to your point, right? And uh, sorry about that. That's okay. Not everything is, is working right now, and we should be looking at a lot of uh, the way that our system is, is um, being ran, uh, these different laws, uh, objectively, and, and honestly say um, if they're working or not. And that was one of the things that, 
you know, prior to, to all this, uh, I was in uh, grad school um, getting my master's in, in public administration. And that was one of my, my biggest frustrations with, with uh, sort of uh, working in these larger systems is, is that if a program, a policy fails, uh, no one really wants to take responsibility for that. And so they'll just let it be there. Mm -hmm. And they'll, regardless, you know, it could be the worst program, the worst policy. It could be very damaging. And it'll be there for 10, 15, 20 plus years because no one wants to address it because that would be admitting fault. Mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. I just listened recently to a podcast about the D.A.R.E. program. Uh, do you, I'm not old enough to that have actually learned that in school. Are you said, is that something you learned about in school? The, it, was, it was like the tail in the tail end of, of, of me. Yeah. At that point I had, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the dog? Um, there was oh, like a dog that, oh, I don't remember. I, again, I, the, <laughs> it, it was phased out I'm before I was old enough to be in those classes, but uh, appa apparently there's some like new version of it that's got a different name now, but apparently there were studies suggesting that, that were showing that it was basically ineffective, something like 15 years before it finally ended. And we kept using it still over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And, and see that that's the sort of, uh, uh thing that that we we, we have trouble with mm -hmm. um you know and why i sort of see um the our, our ability to, to to look at that critically right that the whole thing of being a good citizen um as as one of the key things i i think the a lot of the people who are doing work here locally are are, are very much considered like rebel rousers and and that these people are critically like complaining and they're always out here protesting uh, and and as the the system, right? You never want to be criticized, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and because of that, like you're automatically like on the defense of it, and and you know you, you almost uh, uh, are, are then setting yourself up to to never allow yourself to change. Mm -hmm. And and I think uh, not just organizations, you know, governments, uh, but even just individually, you know, when when you sort of like box yourself in and, and not allow yourself to grow, I I think that's a a very sad thing, you know, to, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, if everything was right, then organizations like the ones you work with wouldn't exist. And this is something we talked about a few weeks ago when we had Ria Wong on. Um, but like the, the existence of nonprofits and charitable organizations implies that there are problems. Um, and this isn't one of the questions I, uh, that I was planning on asking you, but it's something I asked her. Do you think that the idea of like, do you, do you think that the work that nonprofits do ever creates like a sense of complacency um, that prevents more system, systematic change? Uh, the example I gave when I talked with her before was that I saw on the Today Show, you know, that morning news show on NBC, Al Roker, whoever it was, he went to some underprivileged school and he had a big truck and he gave everyone laptops at the school. And I'm thinking, that's great. But what about all the schools that don't have Al Roker showing up with a truck full of laptops? And what about all the people who are looking at this and they're feeling good and they're, they're, they're like, oh, things are good in the world. But reality, they're not. The fact that that school needed laptops, that needed Al Roker to give them laptops is a problem. And do you think that that sense of complacency can prevent more systematic change like laws and government action that could actually make a, a bigger difference? Yeah. Um, I, I think that that is probably um, one of the hardest things is, is that complacency in, in the nonprofit world. Because um, like with anything, I, I think you, you hit a certain groove of, of what you're able to deliver. Um, and especially the, the way that funding is tied in nonprofits, it's usually for a very specific cause. You know, they, they're like, we're, we're specifically funding you to do, you know, this, to like hand out uh, backpacks every summer. And you're like, great. We love handing out backpacks, but our families also need food. And they're like, oh, sorry, we're not paying you to hand people food. And it's that sort of like uh, red tape and, and kind of hitting a brick wall that, that sort of drives that complacency. Uh, realizing that there are um, huge needs in your community that you uh, aren't able to fill, you know, and, and that's um, where we get to your point where all uh, nonprofits should be advocating a lot more, you know, and um, 
that's one of the things that, that we, we often say is like, I, I hope, and, it's, and that was always, I hope I would be able to work my way out of a job, mm-hmm. uh, which is the ultimate goal, right? That these uh, issues don't make sense. <laughs> but, um, you know, re- realizing that uh, nonprofits have a, a very small, like, ability to help, like, on a very surface level, but we, we need to be able to address these uh, systemic issues. Um, mm-hmm. For nonprofits, in, inviting your your local lawmakers, uh, state lawmakers, right to, to your nonprofits, having these these pieces of, of content telling uh, the reality of, of what's happening on the ground. That's where you you really make change, right? We we need uh, whoever's making these policies, these laws, to be able to connect with the people that you're serving, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what's important. That's what's ultimately going to be able to drive uh, change in the in the longer run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I think of it like, so there are all these healthcare nonprofits that do all kinds of things to help provide people healthcare. And the whole reason we, that that's an issue is because our healthcare system is broken. And if we had a functioning universal healthcare system, then all these nonprofits would disappear overnight. And if their heart's in the right place, if they're doing this for the right reason, then they'd be glad to disappear. Um, so it's like, kind of just don't take your eye off the ball i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah and and ultimately i mean that that's sort of what what we hope um but but again right that that sort of uh gets back to one of the issues we talked about it's like is it part of the organizational capacity like to be able yeah. to do that are they even thinking about doing that um just just because a, a lot of uh times uh, especially with like smaller nonprofits, you're your CEO is also in charge of fund development and marketing, right? Like all these other hats. Um, and that's, that's sort of the issue. You know, we're, we're so reactionary in the, in the nonprofit world. Uh, but, but being able to take this, this offensive, right? Like, okay, we're, we're going to work harder, not, uh, we're going to work smarter, not harder uh, mm-hmm. for a lot of the work that we want to do. So, your company, like every company, will have finite resources. You've only got so many people, you've only got so much money, you've only got so much time. Um, and so you can't necessarily do everything that everyone asks you to do. So how do you pick and choose what the best causes for you to support are? Um, if Because every now, not every nonprofit does do good things. I mean, the NRA is a nonprofit. Um, how do you... Um, determine how do you are you sure that what your clients are doing is as good as they tell you it is and then um, also what are some like cool stories of people you've worked with who are doing great things yeah so um, so let, let me just kind of backtrack a little uh, and explain uh, through Smize our, our eyewear company so yeah. we sell blue light glasses uh, and I probably should have mentioned that a little bit more in detail <laughs> earlier but um, uh, so we have hella good media and then we have a e-commerce uh, site that uh, we specifically use to fund nonprofits through what we're calling a social impact fund so for every pair of glasses that we uh, sell we actually set aside five dollars into a social impact fund that um, we're actually trying to work out the deal for two specific nonprofits here in san jose um, but from there we also have uh, our, our affiliate program that is able to uh, partner up with different nonprofit agencies uh, and donate, you know, twenty percent of our uh, of our total sales within a month. So it, it's that uh, ability for us, you know, again as our organization, our organizational values to uh, really uh, allocate, you know, our resources, our, our hard resources, which is cash, right? Which is what what all sort of. Uh, organizations kind of need uh, and sometimes cash without restriction which is another big thing right for them to do very like targeted um, uh, community work um, recognizing that you know to, to your question now is how do we pick and choose the people we want to work with um, the, the first thing is is having the the relationship with these various nonprofits I, I think in the the world of philanthropy um, a lot of the times, um as you know these different administrators uh you know it's it's like separate worlds almost and they're coming in trying to figure out what what they're really doing uh versus me having come from the nonprofit world having those relationships with folks seeing what they're actually doing uh 
sending my clients over to their organizations for resources, right? Because we can't fulfill everything as, as one individual organization. Um, is, is really having that, that sort of relational uh, aspect to it, uh, be key in, in picking um, who gets, you know, different pots of money. So uh, for one of the ones that we're looking into and, you know, it's still, still not solidified, so I'm almost kind of hesitant to, to name drop, but, uh, you know, a lot of the, their work, they're, they're more of a art nonprofit um, out in East San Jose. And um, a lot of their work more specifically now, especially since COVID has been uh, shifted to those direct resources. And that, that is one thing that, that we saw is like, yes, you, you had the, um, the one that, that awareness, right? That, that you know, as, as a sort of a, a cultural center, maybe that's not meeting the needs of folks right now. And, but you do have the capacity to serve in these other ways. So being able to shift, uh, to allocate different resources to uh, meeting the community's needs, right? That, that's important to me. Um, and that's that's sort of uh, the the step we should all take. The other one is is another one um, that uh, spawned out of the the George Floyd protest here in mm -hmm. uh, San Jose, and uh, they basically committed to uh, supporting protesters and uh, our homeless population. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a, a like a micro nonprofit. It's like I want to say maybe like five people. That are How do they do that? Homeless. How do they support protesters? Uh, so, so one of the things that they saw very early on is, um, you know, the, these protests were going on on throughout uh, all summer. So they they out of their own pocket, you know, uh, they went out, they started getting snacks, they started getting water, mm -hmm. uh, especially you know as some of the protests got kind of a little bit more violent. You know, having that uh, uh, when people like they started spraying like tear gas and all that, you know, being able to support folks with that, providing masks so people can protest safely, gloves, right, that PPE. Mm -hmm. uh, was big, so uh, they they filed for a nonprofit status. Then they started being able to receive donations, and they've been slowly uh, transitioning to also uh, support our um, houseless population uh, mm -hmm. during this time as well, being able to to feed them and um, do that. So uh, the reason we we chose them is because they, uh, aside from you know all this other work, were very like grassroots, and because they were so new. Uh, we wanted to make sure that, you know, this became an organization that was sustained for the long haul. Because that's something that happens is a lot of times uh, folks file for nonprofit status and they're able to make it last for maybe like less than a year, right? It's, it's sometimes very specific or they just don't have enough bandwidth to, to take on some more work that, that needs to happen. So that's what, what we were really trying to do is, is uh, when we pick them. From there, you know, the other programs, that, uh, nonprofits that we have in our affiliate program, one thing we're looking at is, is sort of this capacity we're looking at how big they are we're also looking at how much funding they already have uh not sort of disqualifying these larger nonprofits, but we want to work with smaller organizations mm -hmm. that maybe don't have these opportunities and access to funds awesome um so yeah so when you said you're looking for some looking at how many people they have you're looking from for the smaller side as well as with the funding yeah for Generally the most part, speaking. we, we want to uh, uh, be able to support smaller uh, RAND nonprofits. Uh, and that's mostly because we, we know that, you know, the, the smaller they are, the more connected they are to the community for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not taking away from, from some of the work that these larger uh, nonprofits do, but um, oftentimes uh, there, there can well, be... Also, just if they're a, larger, they may not need as much help, right? Yeah, they might not need as much help, but but they usually uh, get to a point where uh, there's a lot of layers of separation between, you know, what we call the, the grass tops and the, the grass roots. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I want to talk a little bit about what you did before you started Hello Good Media. Um, mm -hmm. But in order to fully appreciate your story, I think people need to understand the community you came from because your story is very centered in your community. And so first, why don't you um, tell everyone a little bit about what your community is and then tell us uh, about what you did before you uh, got into this. Yeah, so um, I, I, right here in, in San Jose, uh, I grew up in the Seven Trees community, which is a community in uh, Southside San Jose. And I always tell people, uh, we like to present like we don't have an inner city, but we do. Uh, it's the south side, the north side, east side, west side, and then you get into other populations like South San Jose, East Foothills, North San Jose, right, West San Jose, like all these things. So 
a, a lot of our concentration of um, low-income residents, um, poverty is centered around our downtown area. So I grew up uh, right on the, the edge of it in, in uh, my Seven Truth community. And, um, you know, growing up as a kid, you, you don't, I think, fully recognize the, the amount of uh, uh, poverty and, and harsh uh, conditions that you sort of grow yeah. up in. Um, but for us, you know, it was uh, in my community specifically, and we were very lucky. And that was one thing that I always tell folks. I, I didn't realize how privileged I was till like after, uh, be, because you know my my parents were in in our neighborhood, were they owned a home? They were. I had two parents who both had jobs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until like I was older that I realized that you know a lot of my friends weren't as lucky as I was. So. Uh, having grown up with, with that experience, you know, essentially growing up thinking you're, you're poor, right? Because, you know, you have uh, immigrant parents and they're, they're constantly telling you this, but uh, also having that, that reality that uh, you knew that you didn't struggle as much as some of your friends it was very um, yeah. essential to, to like who I ended up becoming, you know? Yeah, my, a, um, like, my brother is trying to start a rap career and he made this song where he's uh, going, I start at where he says in the song, I started with nothing. And I'm like, you started middle class. I was there. <laughs> you started as a white middle class kid in the suburbs. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, 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 and that's sort of the, the reality. Uh, and on top of that, I always tell folks, right, that, that um, you know, I, I also lucky I grew up a man in a, in a mm -hmm. Latino household. Um, I, I, I say I have height privilege as well because I'm I'm six one right and I didn't have to suffer through through any of those other things but uh, but yeah it was sort of what the back to like seven trees what 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 ended up happening is you know I think it was maybe like sixth seventh grade uh, uh, our our neighbors you know were were the the sort of like gangsters of, of the block and uh, the drug dealers so. Um, they were uh, what we call classified like Norteños, right? Um, mm -hmm. So their color's red. And uh, back then there was this stupid thing where like if your family was more Mexican or spoke, spoke more Spanish, you were automatically classified as Sureño, so blue. So there there was always like this hidden tension that I didn't really recognize between like uh, their family and my family. Because granted, like the, our neighbors, like the, the kids who were my age were my friends, you know, and we would play all the time and hang out. So, uh, at one point, you know, during a family party, there was a scuffle and, you know, my, my dad ended up getting shot, you know, luckily he, you know, he survived um, and it was just like kind of like a flesh wound. But uh, yeah, it just like scared my parents and we ended up moving, you know, probably like a mile away, not, not too far. I was still able to stay within the district, but um, it, it was that sort of whole experience that, that sort of kind of woke me up to the realities of, of kind of my community. Um, from there, you know, like as I was going through high school, uh, violence and violence in the community was very real, uh, especially like gun violence. Seven Trees was considered the murder capital of uh, San Jose for, for my entire idea of like high school. So um, it was all that work that kind of led me to the nonprofit world. You know, I, I had these, these constant like um, uh, early childhood experiences, experiences through adolescence that, that kind of drove me to this work. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, from from there, you know, I, I started working with families uh, right out of high school. I, I worked after school programs, and I did that for about five, six years. Uh, and it was that that experience uh, working with kids of from like uh, kinder to to twelfth grade that you know I, I really saw um, how quickly students come into school unprepared, but also once they they fall back that they stay there forever. Um, and, and the moment where like I, I kind of knew I was done and I got burnt out was um, when I, I had a, a like an 18 year old, you know, 12th grader, uh, and they still didn't know how to read. And I was like, how how does that happen? You mm -hmm. know, um, and that just kind of like broke my heart. So um, I, I kind of went from working with you know older kids to starting at the very beginning. So after I graduated college, I got a job uh, working with families with children zero to five. Um, and I really saw that early childhood as, as the biggest potential to, to kind of fix a lot of our things. If we can do whatever we can to strengthen the capacity of parents and to support children at an early age and make sure that they go to school prepared uh, before they even hit kindergarten, right? And they have all these high quality early childhood experiences. 
then we can mitigate like a lot of the the things that happen once they hit you know elementary middle school high school um so from there you know uh, i worked there for about a couple of years and and then i had this very unique opportunity to work with parents um who are themselves incarcerated so physically going into the jails into the jail our county jail system there uh, was a, a tremendous experience we we would do parenting workshops we would um also work with the parents to develop uh, reunification plans and success plans. So as they're getting ready to go out, you know, what, what are the steps that you can do? Not mm-hmm. even focused on the child yet, but what are some of the things you can do to ensure that you have a healthy reentry? And, mm-hmm. um, as you are getting on the right path and getting the appropriate resources, you know, now we can look at, all right, when and how can we help you reunify with your child in, in a way that's not gonna further like traumatize them. It's gonna work not just for you, but everyone else who this child is connected to so um mm-hmm. it, it was that that sort of work that really opened my eyes even more so you know that a lot of the experiences that that i had as a child um uh and then you know working with with these kids because i ended up running to, to kids i worked with in the after school program and to, to see that you know you're just like okay we, you you always kind of have that hunch you know like hey this this kid's on on a bad path he might end up somewhere uh, but to actually see it, you know, is 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 kind of difficult. So yeah, that's gonna uh, be sad. Yeah, I always I always keep keep those those kids in mind and those experiences, you know, as as uh, proof, you know, like the the work that we we need to do and we're doing now is is critical. Because if if not, you know, this this is the likelihood for a lot of children out there the the sort of outcomes that they mm-hmm. have. Yeah, and um, our system doesn't do nearly enough to help people who are coming out of prison um, re-enter society in a productive way. And really, like, we even put up barriers to people re-entering society in a healthy way, and it just makes people more likely to re-offend. It makes it harder to live a normal life. And a lot of crime is caused by people not having opportunities. So if someone's going to come out of prison and you're going to say, not only are we going to not help you get any opportunities, we're going to take away all of your opportunities, um, that's just going to make someone more likely to end up back in prison. And, uh, that's something we'll talk about in a minute, but, uh, the story you told about the kid who still couldn't read, um, that's, uh, kind of pressing into me because I just heard another story about, um, uh, someone else who didn't know how to read is into their twenties. And, you know, America has like something like a 97% adult literacy rate, I think, but, and people hear that and they're like, it's a high number, but that still means three percent are illiterate which is in a country as big as america is millions of people still that's still a lot of people and so i think that's um that that's something that uh, people don't realize i guess do you think that these problems that you see in your community are well rep are representative of what exists in other communities as well and what do you think some of the root causes are excuse me yeah um I, I would definitely say that that sort of uh, the the issues that we had in, in my community, like social, economic, or all that, uh, are are not unique at all. This, in fact, this is is pretty much uh, the same experience. Because as I got to meet more folks from from other communities, especially like you know the the inner city communities of, of San Jose, uh, they either had the same stories or had, they had worse stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I began to you know travel and uh, meet all these other people, you know, it's, it's the same thing across the entire country. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the, the sad thing, um, is that we, we all have the, these collective experiences, uh, collective traumas, and there's, there's not this, um, larger sort of, uh, like connection that where we feel each other. I think you, you do when, when you meet folks, um, but there's also like a lot of shame in that. You know, some, it's something that you're not necessarily supposed to talk about. Uh, and, and I think especially uh, getting to the point of like the, the literacy, you know, uh, from a early age, you know, especially when, when I talked to that uh, individual, you know, it was like, how come you never told us? It was like, well, you know, teachers always like yell at me or this or or if I tell them, you know, they then they, they look at me um, and like sad, you know, like pity. They take pity on them. Um, and I think, uh, you know, th- there's not that sort of like space to, to be able to be vulnerable and admit, 
you know that you are behind um but also to admit that that you need help like that that's something that that's uh uh not sort of like commonplace within these communities as well you're, you're supposed to uh, that whole idea of like picking yourself up by your bootstraps has always been there um which is complete like bs you know um and that that's sort of uh what, what we're kind of seeing with, with all of this and when it comes to these, these larger social issues right there, there's this large connection between all of us um that we're we're now just getting to like normalizing these discussions yeah, you know, you mentioned the phrase, pick yourself up your, your bootstraps being not really a real thing. You know that phrase was originally meant to describe an impossible task? Because if you, if you think about it, imagine someone reaching down to their feet and grabbing the straps in their boots and trying to pick themselves up by their bootstraps. It's something that you can't, it's not possible to do. And that's what that phrase was originally meant. Uh, so I don't know how we twisted that into this like feel-good story of individual achievement. That doesn't that doesn't really sit well with me. Yeah, um, and, and it's, 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 I think it's it's really tied into that whole like m American like mythos, right? That you're supposed to be this like self-starter and all that. Mm -hmm. It's like for for everyone, you know, like like Andrew Carnegie, right? Like all these kinds of industry or like even now like elon musk these like one success stories you know there's there's millions and millions mm -hmm. of people who are not able to overcome that adversity mm -hmm. and it's it's really being able to like what happens to those people you know and for, for me and my work like what happens to the people who uh uh come out of like the system of incarceration right and are, are re-entering uh and don't make it and they relapse mm -hmm. or they they have to recommit a crime or reoffend. uh what happens to to that kid who falls behind like a reading level uh and can't catch up over the course you know do they get held back or are teachers you know just let them slide because you know it's, it's easier to just keep them going and focus on the new batch of people so uh it's 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 a lot of hard work uh, all across the board and um a lot of hard decisions that that people have to make yeah um i mean this to what we were getting to earlier things aren't great right um <laughs> a lot of things aren't great um, so before we get finished, I wanted to talk to you about some th one thing that was specific since you have experience working in the prison system. Um, there's been a lot, America has gotten a lot of criticism for poor condi uh, li conditions in our prisons. Um, in fact, just recently it was in the news because a British, uh, Julian Assange was supposed to be extradited and a British judge cited, among other things, the poor conditions in U.S. prisons um, as a reason why he couldn't be extradited. Um, is that your experience, uh, having been someone who worked in prisons? Yeah, they're they're terrible. They're um, the the conditions, and and I will say that speak because uh, I want to clarify. I, I worked in in our county jail system, which is different from our, okay. our prison yeah. system, right? Which is which is a, a state based, uh, but even in our county jail system, um, and I will say, you know, experience you know visiting family within prison systems, uh, th they're not great their uh, the conditions themselves are pretty terrible and bleak um, here locally uh, they have been issues that you know have, have led to like lawsuits um, or various things um, you know brutality the actual physical conditions for foods even now uh, there, there's a, a hunger strike because the conditions around um, COVID protocols are so terrible uh, that, that it's led to these massive like outbreaks within the jails and y you look at that it's it's part like uh, organizational it's part the physical environment and the way that these uh, jails were designed um, th they're not designed to help people and, and that's the the first and foremost part and uh, for what we call you know um, our, our justice system they're, they're completely unjust there is no justice uh, and especially the role that our county jail system is supposed to take. It's, it's supposed to be a lot of rehabilitation. Um, and there, there just isn't that. There's not enough focus on, on being able to, to ensure that when these people get out, they, they are either starting off in a place that they can actually succeed or that um, they, they have learned the essential skills or whatever to, to better themselves, you know a lot of what they're still teaching in, in jails at times is, is like outdated curriculum 
and you, you look at that um we're, we're not preparing jobs for we're pre not preparing people for jobs that will actually pay a living wage in uh santa clara county so when we tell people you know you can get a job and make minimum wage and they're like well i can go back to you know the trap house and and make double that uh for less work you know of course they're going to do that or i can go out and, and maybe live in in the creek and panhandle and and do some petty theft and, and be able to survive you know uh, it's easier because it's less stressful right mm -hmm. uh, so that that's the unfortunate reality of of our kind of uh, jail system and, and prison system um you know i think a lot of the problems in um the jail and prison system gets back to what we were talking about earlier about thinking critically because i think this is one of those issues where people have an emotional response where people at least people who have never had contact with the jail or prison system um have this emotional response of oh well those are criminals and i don't particularly care about what happens to them and you know they need to be punished and it's the same kind of idea as the death penalty i think is another one where people feel like oh no well that person killed someone like they it's right that they be executed but if you look more critically there are a lot of reasons why no matter what your particular feelings about that person are there are a lot of reasons why it's better for society to be a little more humane like a lot of rational reasons about how oh when you release prisoners if you're good to them and you make it easier for them to get jobs then there will be less crime and there will be less poverty and there'll be more they'll be contributing to society more they'll be paying more taxes and we won't have to pay for them to go back to prison they won't commit a crime that puts them back into prison it's going to harm society um, and that's why when I made my, a while back, when I made my videos about uh, the prison system, I tried to be very, um, not coming to this from a, oh, this is the right thing to do, this is morally right kind of thing, but like, here are the numbers about why it's good for the big picture for us to take care of prisoners. Um, and I feel like people just don't look at it like that. Um, what are some of the things that you think can be done to make this better? I mean, um... One is is really telling telling these stories of, of folks, uh, and I, I think that's one thing that that uh, you're sort of trained not to do, especially at, after you exit, right? You have this sort of mark on your record, and you're supposed to never talk about it. But uh, being in jail is a very traumatic thing, and um, I, I I think the the more we can do to to sort of break that narrative uh, that this is like you know uh, where criminal masterminds go. Uh, a lot of people in jail are, are in there for like petty things, drug offenses, DUIs, mm -hmm. especially on the local level, um, issues to, to being like homeless, you know, theft, like those sort mm -hmm. of things. Um, so, so the more we can do to sort of uh, talk about that, these are the people in our community who need the most support. And we're going to have to do a lot of handholding because a lot of these things that uh, bother you, you know, uh, uh, homelessness being one of them, right? And the blight that comes with it. That's the tip of the iceberg. There's all these other things, these underlying factors that, that lead to that. Um, so one, it, it's that jail isn't this, this crazy place. A, a lot of times it's, it's just like, you know, a bunch of men sitting together and then even like on the women's side, you know, um, and there's sort of the, this community. But we, we one of the interesting statistics here locally, and uh, we, we know that uh, it's somewhere between like seven and nine thousand people um, are, are critical users of, of our county systems, right? They're, they're the most high need populations, uh, and our homeless population is about like ten thousand people, right? Uh, and we, we we start looking at, at this, and there's like a lot of overlap between our homeless pe population, the people who are frequenting our jail system, who are uh, heavy users of, of these other uh, county programs. Uh, and then we, we look beyond that. It's like, okay, now a lot of these people know each other. They're related, right? So it's, it's a lot of generational poverty that that's kind of been broken into. And these are the people who are, are going to jail and uh, almost predetermined from a young age, right? Going back to that, that they're probably likely going to end up in jail at some point. So um, we, we really need to look at this as a, as a whole, right? How we kind of stop people from going to jail in the first place. And then once we get out, uh, how do we support you in a way that's going to make it likely that you don't reoffend? Mm -hmm. 
Awesome. So we're a little bit past our hour, Jonathan. Um, I had a great chat, but I want to let get uh, I want to let you have a chance to pitch wherever people can follow you, what you're working on. Uh, tell us a little bit about your podcast and um, what what people can follow you on and all of that stuff. Yeah, so uh, you, you can follow a little bit more of the journey that, that we're doing with the uh, community storytelling uh, pieces. It's really centered at what I call uh, comida, which is food, culture, and uh, community, right? The, the things that really bring us together. Uh, and you can follow me at Hella Good Media for, for those uh, visual storytelling uh, pieces. Uh, and then for the podcast, it's at uh, Smize Eyewear on Instagram. Um, and right there, uh, it'll have the links to the podcast. Uh, for the podcast itself, we're really trying to bridge the, the gap between personal and community resources uh, and the larger community. So we're going to have a bunch of uh, community advocates, community uh, organizations, nonprofits, as well as uh, what we feel are, are progressive like business leaders uh, who are committed to, to changing their, their communities uh, for the better and, and tr really trying to have uh, great working relationships with folks uh, to sort of uh, share those uh, success stories and, and resources uh, with us all. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do is, is make sure that we have this other access point to some of the community resources out there. Awesome, yeah, and there's also a link in the description uh, to go follow, uh, subscribe to his podcast. It's Crack of Smiles, that's right? Crack of Smiles? Yeah, it's, Crack of And it's Smiling Eyes. I always tell people that. Oh, okay, okay. That makes, okay, that makes it easier. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a link in the description to go subscribe to that. Definitely go follow Jonathan on Facebook, Instagram. Are you on Twitter? Uh, Hello Good Media, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Hello Good Media and all of that stuff. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you for having me. I was uh, really excited. And it's a very great chat you know, mm. to be yeah. able to talk about this. Yeah, I had a great time. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Uh, we've got a great video coming out this weekend about how Law & Order became the dog whistle of, of um, oppression. So definitely go and watch that. I'll see you guys next week. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.